At least four young children have been killed by a man wielding a hatchet in a kindergarten in the city of Blumano in southern Brazil. And another four children between the ages of three to five were injured by the 25-year-old man who entered the creche at around nine local time yesterday. According to hospital officials, at least one of them is reportedly in a serious condition. Police told local media that the attacker had surrendered and is now in police custody. In a statement, military police said that the assailant had handed himself in at one of their stations in the town. Firefighters and three boys and a girl were killed in the playground. They are thought to have been between the ages of four and seven years old. In total, approximately 40 children had been inside the preschool at the time of the attack. And injured five others in Sao Paulo. Meanwhile, residents gathered for a candlelight vigil to mourn the children killed. Family and friends of the victim and survivors prayed, left flowers and lit candles outside the school. Residents of the Brazilian southern city of Blumenau are still in shock after the attack. In the meantime, Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva has called the attack a monstrosity. Speaking during a meeting with government ministries and governors in Brasilia, the president asked the meeting's attendees to observe a minute of silence for the families of the victims. Today is a day that leaves us human beings angry because of a figure that seems to be a human. It has a head, arms, legs and eyes, but that committed a monstrosity that all of us who are fathers, mothers, grandparents, uncles would never imagine could happen. This human figure that had nothing human, it must have come from another planet, a hate planet, had the stupidity to kill four children with an axe and injure three. I don't have words to comfort the families. Whoever has lost a relative knows there are no words. But I think it is important for us to do a gesture. So let's have a minute of silence in honor of those children who were victims of that barbarity. Edgar Maciel, Voice of America correspondent, joins me now from Sao Paulo. Good of you to join us, uh, Edgar. Can you tell us a little bit more about the stabbing at the kindergarten school today? Uh, good afternoon, Brazil. Uh, Blumenau City in Santa Catarina State, uh, where this attack took place, uh, down in an atmosphere of mourning. Uh, one day after the attack, uh, on this day at care center, they left four children there and five other injured. Uh, all schools were closed, even suspended, uh, and we can feel a lot of sadness uh, in the streets. Uh, these four children who died are being veiled through these third days, and they are going to be buried during the afternoon here in Brazil. Uh, the wake of three of them are in the same place. It's a, it's a way for families to help each other in difficult time. Uh, the children have been between the ages of four and seven years old. Of the victims that were injured, four of them are still hospitalized. And according to the doctors, no one has any risk of life. Uh, many people went to the front of the school uh, in Blumenau, which is located in the south of Brazil, leaving candles, uh, many toys, so, uh, messages asking peace, remembering that it was an uh, attack on the schools in, the uh, in two years, in 2003, three years, and three uh, teachers were uh, with them. It's very sad indeed, Edgar. How do we even know how did the attacker gain access into the school premises and what kind of security measures did the school have and will they now take? Uh, for you to know, this is a Brazilian state uh, with the best uh, security indexes, few murders, uh, few cases of even there. Uh, it is not, uh, not normal for this like this to happen in Santa Catarina. Uh, uh, it is the exception of this episode. Uh, and according to police, the 25-year-old murder arrived at a care center 
uh, on a motorcycle, uh, jump over the wall and start attacking the children with a hatch. Uh, the victims were hit in the head area and one teacher said to the press that everything happened uh, very quickly, that the whole team uh, was surprised that she only had time to take the babies, the youngest ones, and lock them uh, in the bathroom to save them. Uh, so after this, the killer was arrested. The cluster uh, here to be uh, the term whether humans uh, or not is going to be this afternoon in Brazil. And again, it's not normal for Brazil to have police or enforce private security, especially the care centers, um, which are considered safe events in all of Brazil. Edgar, what are police saying about the motive of the attacker? Do we have any further information about the attacker? Uh, the police is to not, do, not, do not know what motivates this attack. Um, investigators have his cell phone to try to, to find out if anyone else was involved in planning this attack of the school. Uh, but I wanted to share an important piece of information about why the press here in Brazil uh, is not publicizing too much the killer's story. It, uh, it has always been uh, a trend around here to, to name, to aid, to explore every details uh, of this type of person. Uh, but numerous researchers uh, have pointed out that it's only motivates, uh, motivators, uh, new murders like this to happen. Uh, it, it simulates and encourage. Uh, that's because why uh, they see these killers uh, as a trophy, someone who have uh, successfully kill innocent people. So that's why Brazilian journalists uh, made a pact not to reveal the identity of those behind uh, these attacks to not stimulate new, uh, new cases in our country. That's a very interesting and unique response to not encourage these types of killings for, for fame. Now, uh, police have mentioned a little bit about the attacker's history of having a, some violence and drugs and even having had stabbed their stepfather in March of 2021. The question is, how does a man with this type of history make it this far? Yeah, he has four things uh, with the police here in Brazil. Uh, the first one was in 2016, uh, to, to, to a fight in a nightclub. And in 2021, he was arrested after stabbing his stepfather. Already in 2022, he signed a deal uh, in terms of cocaine. In the same year, he was arrested after breaking a and stabbed the door. So visibly, he has serious high psychological problems, and, and that's uh, where another very important detail comes in, uh, the lack of intervention from the family itself. In Brazil, no one can be turned without consent, uh, even after being released from a crime. Uh, so uh, it is in these type of cases that we see how important uh, the family's nucleus is to alert, alert the authorities and also to provide uh, to someone who is visibly out of control. Edgar, just last month, a Brazilian teen stabbed her teacher to death. So is there a history of school violence in Brazil or is this a new devastating trend? No, definitely not. Uh, compared to the US, for example, Brazil does not have a history of school attacks. Uh, and violence, this kind of violence. This is a very recent process here. Uh, in the last two decades, for example, there have been 24 attacks uh, on schools. And this is related to the gun policy uh, that Brazil has been adopting in recent years. For example, the last government of former President Jair Bolsonaro made the exit to, to firearms very flexible here. But this is the number of guns uh, related to these weapons. Uh, and remembering that our country uh, even with very high levels of violence to, to drug trafficking, for example, has never had such frequent cases of attacks on home schools. Uh, in the last few weeks, the system case that happened here in Sao Paulo, the bad teacher, all the attempts and attacks have appeared on a daily basis. 
So I think our role as the press should be very responsible uh, when it comes to reporting facts like this, uh, so as not to encourage uh, this to be harmful. And my final question to you, Edgar, is how are authorities and governments responding, government responding to this issue? Uh, so the Brazilian government is very scared, I guess, by this, uh, in this kind of cases. Up to yesterday, President Lula announced that he would launch a program uh, to strengthen security school areas across Brazil in the first phase uh, with more police roles and, and security consider high risk. Uh, Brazilian Congress also promised to, to analyze the proposals so that new attacks do not happen more. But everything is still uh, in the theoretical field uh, without any very strong corrections. All right, Edgar Maciel, thank you so very much for joining us. You're welcome. And moving on to our next story, the Palestinians are protesting against clashes between Israeli police and Palestinians at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque after morning and evening prayers. During protests in Gaza, demonstrators were seen waving Hamas flags, carrying placards and burning tires. Clashes occurred at the mosque compound yesterday night, hours after the arrest and removal of more than 350 people in a police raid, and despite a U.S. appeal to ease tensions. The confrontations during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan and on the eve of the Jewish Passover holiday triggered a cross-border exchange of fire in Gaza and stoked fears of further violence. In the second instance, police entered the compound and tried to evacuate worships, worshippers using stun grenades and firing rubber bullets, where six people were reported injured. <laughs> Morocco has condemned the intervention of Israeli police in the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and denounced what it calls the aggression and terror of the faithful in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan. The Sharifian kingdom stressed the need to respect the legal, religious and historical status of Jerusalem and the holy places and to avoid all practices and violations that are likely to destroy all chances for peace in the region. The Israeli police announced Wednesday that they had arrested more than 350 people during the violent clashes overnight after the police intervened inside one of the world's most revered Muslim places of worship to dislodge worshippers. Morocco, an ally of Israel, has tried to regularly reiterate its commitment to the Palestinian cause under the leadership of King Mohammed VI, who chairs the Al-Quds Committee, responsible for pre preserving the Arab Muslim character of Jerusalem. After former U.S. President Donald Trump pleaded not guilty in a Manhattan court to 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, he will have to make his way through judicial process as he also wages a presidential campaign. But according to legal analyst Catherine Ross, who was speaking at a news conference who said Mr. Trump falsified records as part of a scheme to violate state and federal election laws. Trump has been accused of orchestrating payments to two women before the 2016 election to suppress publication of their sexual encounters with the former president. The arraignment in New York um, was unusual in a number of respects, besides the fact that a former president was being arraigned. Uh, it lasted an hour. These are usually very short. The court heard some important arguments about the parameters of the case and the defendant's behavior. Um, I was um, struck that the 34 felony counts were all essentially variations of the same count. In other words, each count identified a particular false business record and explained that that falsehood, which is itself illegal in New York, um, also uh, was tied to a felony with the intent to either promote a felony or conceal a felony 
one of the um, rockier, grayer areas of this case is whether the state of New York can rely on a federal crime that the federal government has not prosecuted in order to show that there was a crime associated with the falsehood in the business records. And so what I think Trump Bragg has done well is to build a multi-layered indictment that if a court says you cannot rely on the federal crimes, we also have New York state crimes. And there should be no doubt that New York state can link the business records violations to its own crimes. And the White House says Britain's King Charles has invited U.S. President Joe Biden to the United Kingdom for a state visit, and Biden accepted the invitation. The invitation comes during a conversation between Mr. Biden and King Charles on Tuesday in which Biden informed the king that U.S. First Lady Jill Biden would attend his coronation in May. Traditionally, U.S. presidents do not attend British monarchs' coronations. White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre said she did not have a specific timeline for when the visit would take place, but said it would be in the near future. First say, and um, the president uh, had about a 25-minute, 30-minute call with uh, King, King, uh, King, King Charles III, and during which he congratulated the king. I think we put that out uh, last night, his upcoming uh, coronation. And they have a very friendly uh, conversation. They have a, a, a good relationship with the king. He talked about uh, how he enjoyed meeting, uh, visiting uh, the queen, I should say, back in 2021, he and the first lady at Windsor. And uh, he hoped to visit again soon. Actually, during that call, the king offered uh, for him to come and do a state a state visit, which which uh, the president accepted. And uh, and so they will see each other again very soon. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. But again, they have a very good relationship. There are many things that they both uh, care about, key shared values, uh, key shared issues that they want to continue to discuss, like climate change. And that conversation will continue and there will be uh, a visit in the near future. The president um, is looking forward. He had a great conversation, has a good relationship with uh, King Charles III. Uh, and uh, they've, they, uh, as you know, they've met before. And uh, there's a lot of shared interests, the shared values of uh, issues that they want to discuss and they will continue to discuss, uh, one of them being climate change. Uh, and, uh, and at some time in the future, uh, the king invited the president for a state visit. He accepted and that will happen. Uh, just don't have anything further to share on that. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has defended plans to house migrants on a barge off England's southern coast. Britain said it had leased a barge to house 500 migrants on its southern coast as part of efforts to reduce the use of costly hotels as temporary accommodation while asylum claims are being processed. Sunak has made cracking down on illegal migration one of his top priorities ahead of an ex election expected to take place next year and has set out plans to bar the entry of asylum seekers arriving in small boats across the channel. We can't have a situation we are collectively spending £6 million a day on hotels for illegal asylum seekers. That can't be right. I said that I would do everything I could to stop that and reduce the pressure on our communities from asylum seekers being in hotels. And that's what we're doing. We're bringing forward alternative sites like indeed the barge that we've announced today that will save us money and indeed reduce pressure on hotels, all part of our plan to stop the boats. We're also putting through Parliament a new law which will ensure that if you arrive here illegally, you will not have the ability to stay. We will be able to detain you and then swiftly remove you to your own country if it's safe or a third alternative, third country alternative like Rwanda, commemorating 25 years of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And it's important to remember that that agreement helped bring peace and stability to Northern Ireland. And it was the balance that was so integral to that agreement that had been disrupted by the protocol. I was pleased that we were able to agree the new Windsor framework to ensure that we could restore that balance. It's important that we also protect and support and ensure women's rights. And I fundamentally believe that biological sex is important in that regard. That's why uh, the Secretary of State asked the Independent uh, Advisory Board for advice on this matter. They've responded and we will consider that advice in the normal way as we always do in these matters. 
U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has met with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen in California, becoming the most senior U.S. figure to meet a Taiwanese leader on U.S. soil since 1979. Despite threats of retaliation from China, which claims self-rude Taiwan as its own, both discussed a sense of mutual support and cooperation in their statements. Today I'm honored to meet with Taiwan's President Tsai. I believe our bond is stronger now than at any time or point in my lifetime. We will honor our obligations and reiterate our commitment to our shared values behind which all Americans are united. Their presence and unwavering support reassure the people of Taiwan that we are not isolated and we are not alone. However, it is no secret that today, the peace that we have maintained and the democracy which have worked hard to build are facing unprecedented challenges. In a discussion with congressional leaders this morning, I reiterated Taiwan's commitment to defending the peaceful status quo. I also highlighted a belief which President Reagan championed that to preserve peace, we must be strong. Meanwhile, thousands of people rallied in Los Angeles to protest against the meeting between Taiwan region leader Tsai Ing-wen and U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Thousands of overseas Chinese from Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oregon, and other parts of the U.S. staged a protest outside the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, expressing their hope for the peaceful reunification of China and firmly opposing the Taiwan independence pursued by Tsai. The rally was also joined by many other U.S. anti-war activists, with many expressing their opposition to McCarthy's reckless move to meet with Tsai, believing it to be a provocation which risks peace. Others noted that the One China policy was clearly stated in the Shanghai communique, which was issued back in 1972 and has been recognized by the international community for decades. Some expressed opposition to any contact between U.S. government officials and leaders of China's Taiwan region, and said the U.S. government should not meddle in China's internal affairs, particularly over the Taiwan question. And still ahead on the program, dolphins create a charming atmosphere and entertain kids as they find a new home in a Romanian aquarium. Details in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. The foreign ministers of Iran and Saudi Arabia met in Beijing for the first formal meeting of their most senior diplomats in more than seven years. After a China-brokered deal to restore ties between the regional rivals, after years of hostility that fueled conflicts across the Middle East, Tehran and Riyadh agreed to end their diplomatic rift and reopen embassies in a major deal facilitated by China last month. Footage shows Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud and his Iranian counterpart Hussein Amir Abdul Lahyan greet each other before sitting down side by side. Beijing's role in the breakthrough between Tehran and Riyadh shook up dynamics in the Middle East, where the United States was for decades the main mediator. And the president of the Republic of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, says he is seeking a successor that will take over the mantle of leadership. But the peculiar history of the country and its challenges have made it difficult. He made this disclosure when he hosted the president of Kenya, William Ruto. According to Mr. Kagame, the issue of who will succeed him has been on the front burner in his party since 2010, and it's inevitable. The president of Kenya is in Rwanda for a two-day visit and is received by his host, Paul Kagame. You may be seated. 
Done with the welcome formalities, the two countries then sit to put pen to paper for collaborations in the areas of health, youth affairs, ICT, diplomatic training, amongst others. The ease of doing business, they say, will boost the relationship between the two countries, but leadership will be the determinant. This is a bother to the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, who says he's ready to hand over. He's just insisting the successor be worthy. It is an inevitability uh, that we have to find possible grow leaders, and not for me to, to, to decide who is going to be the next leader after me. I think that also uh, is not necessarily uh, co correct, but create uh, an environment, circumstances uh, that will give rise uh, to people who can lead. Meanwhile, Kenya's president is also concerned about the leadership situation in his own country. He appeals to the opposition to seek legal redress. Uh, you asked me a direct question whether there will be a handshake because of this situation. I want to tell you there will be no handshake. But there will be an engagement in parliament on the issues that have been raised, those that can, Parliament can resolve, they will be resolved. I, I know that there is a context, you know, like we were being told here, please have a handshake. <laughs> Unfortunately for us in Kenya, a handshake has a different connotation. <laughs> we are a democracy. And in a democracy, it is underpinned by a system of checks and balances where you have a government and an opposition. Both presidents are optimistic of a new business era following the signing of the Memorandums of Understanding, which will foster deeper integration between the two countries. State electricity utility ESCOM is implementing the worst rolling blackouts on record as its aging coal plants fail leaving households and businesses in Africa's most advanced economy in the dark for up to 10 hours a day. Telecommunications companies have taken a major hit. Let's take a look. It's the peak hour morning traffic in bustling Johannesburg and Sifo Minalose, managing director of a major telecoms provider in South Africa, and his team are assessing their telecom tower before the next two hour long power outage hits the area again. Inside the base station container, he points to backup batteries covered in concrete that the country's biggest mobile network operator has had to install to help power the site when the rolling blackouts hit. The batteries power the tower for up to 12 hours with solar panels just above the container ensuring that they were never depleted. And on days of an extended power outage that runs for several days, Vodacom normally deploys a mobile diesel power generator on site. On average, we're spending as a business uh, well over 300 million rand on uh, just on the incremental cost, not the normal cost, but the incremental cost on load shedding. Um, and of course, that, that varies depending on where we are replacing batteries for fuel, for repairs on sites. Uh, theft is a huge issue for us. Um, and vandalism, theft of the batteries, theft of solar panels, that sort of thing, cables. Uh, and so the cost of repair has increased uh, significantly as well. President Cyril Ramaphosa in February declared a national state of disaster calling the crisis an existential threat to South Africa's social fabric. At stake are essential voice and data services in a country that is trying to develop its digital economy. Mr. Sito says they're having to divert capital expenditure meant for network rollout in underserved areas just to keep their networks up and running. 
another major service provider with 12,900 towers in South Africa is investing 1.5 billion rand, that's about $85 million in solar power, battery and generator installations as well as an enhanced security features at its base stations. Carriers are deploying batteries that have a much longer power span instead of the usual four hours to cope with the longer hours of outages that often lead to poor or no signal. The challenges aren't simply financial as the telecoms ramp up their efforts. Criminal gangs are unfortunately doing the same, targeting newly installed generators, batteries and stealing fuel. Revamping security at tower sites and additional measures to deter theft are making backup rollouts that much more expensive. The cost of rolling out the renewable energy alternatives, the cost of the batteries that are being stolen and vandalized at the various um, centers that they are at, at the towers. The, if you think about the cost, the cost of diesel, that each of you know that fuel keeps going out each and, each and every month. So the moment we are on stages three, four, five, six, then the costs are just going up and up and up. Telcos are now lobbying to benefit from the same fuel rebate enjoyed by the agriculture and mining sectors and are thereby also seeking to save on costs by jointly purchasing and operating backup power equipment. The government last month published draft regulations that would allow this for some energy users, temporarily excluding them from the competition legislation currently preventing the practice. But the final regulatory adjustment have yet to be approved. Filipino toy maker David Tan wanted to memorialize his pet, Golden Retriever, after it passed away in 2019. So he did. So in the way he knew how, by making a plushie of it. Since then, the 48-year-old has helped thousands of other animal lovers cope with the grief of losing their pet by offering a service to create realistic replicas of them. The range of animals Tan and his team have made include various breeds of dogs and cats and also smaller animals such as hamsters and rabbits. And finally, on the program, a dolphinarium in the Black Sea port city of Constanta, Romania, has become home to Ukrainian dolphins. Last year, the dolphinarium took in four dolphins and three sea lions alongside their trainers and doctors, fleeing the shelling in the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. Romania is one out of some 14 European Union states that have dolphinariums and captive sea animals. Hundreds gather to see the animals perform as they watch them swimming with the trainers, jumping through hoops and balancing balls. The dolphins also bring a lot of amusement and delight to the kids in Romania. The dolphins are really cute and they're really talented. And the lions are also really talented and the people that train them, I think, did a really good job. Now we have more colleagues, excepting uh, my Romanian colleagues. Now we have uh, Ukrainian colleagues and uh, Ukrainian dolphin colleagues. Our Romanian staff, it uh, was very, it was new experience for us and for our animals because uh, we are we are different. Uh, they have two very um, old and very beautiful girls. We have very young animals. That's it for the world today. I'm Susan Illion. Thanks for watching. <music>